episode 43 and we're a little bit later um or 10 minutes not definitely not 8 30 a.m it's 8 41 uh benno's here the dog's causing him loads of problems interrupting his podcast life needs needs to get like a, a, a person to sort of look after the dog while he's being an influencer but these things happen well I, I, i've got one she's just at work <laughs> yeah there we go early start um what can you do what can you do um, um how are you uh, I am good. I'm still busy with work, but I've been doing a lot of reading, you know. Uh, yeah, you said you were getting into getting into your reading. What's um, what's the topic of choice? I mean, it's not that I'd never read before. It's just sort of well, yeah. I'm reading a bit more. Uh, <laughs> I'm learning how to read in lockdown. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Never done it before. <laughs> never done a full book. Um, but uh, so I don't know any sort of like fiction, I guess. Um, well, no, oh, okay, so you're, you're not doing. You're not like. You're not doing like research or stats no. or anything. You are I'm literally not. just reading stories. I'm that not. sounds sorry, sorry. That sounds bad. <laughs> but like, don't get me wrong. I love a bit of. Who doesn't love a bit of fiction? I'm not smashing through biographies if that's what you mean. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, that's, that's a better way to put it. Yeah. I did read one about this girl who escaped from North Korea, though. But um, I've just read American Psycho, which is a decent book. Ah, the um, R&T. No, not the R&T. Yeah, the R&T. Yeah, yeah, the R&T gets mentioned. I was like, mate, the Racket Club of New York. Um, yeah. So, and I was like, just after we've done a podcast, I'll do a story. Um, disappointingly low traction on that post. I thought it was quite thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's probably one of those things that you you found for the, like for the first time, but people are like, yeah, I know, mate. That's like one of the most common commonly known things in real tennis. Yeah, I know. I was like, I was gutted, but these things happen. Um, and you also, do, you know, all you can do is put it out there. I know. Also, did you see we got we got advertised in the TNRA email? I haven't actually read it, but you did tell me. Yeah, um, we did. We did. We actually got featured in it. <laughs> featured. Yeah, like we. So in the whole email to every TNRA person member. Yeah. Like our podcast is featured as a great podcast on real tennis, and there are like forty episodes available. Like it's like is all it? right. Was there any mention of Haven Pell's podcast? No. Oh, okay. That's good news. Sorry, not, not good news for Haven, but it's good that we're getting some... Because we're the only one. Um, <laughs> when, where, when was that sent? Oh, do you know what? I'm not going to start looking through my inbox now. I'll do that later. It probably won't uh, be in there. Cause, well, you're not a TNRA guy, are you? So. Uh, actually, do you know what? This is the first year I haven't paid my TNRA membership. Even though I don't have to, because I'm, I'm a pro, I'm still paying or wow. have paid up until. It was sent on Monday, so it said. Um, hang on. A view from the hazards is a podcast about all things real tennis. Click here to see the whole series that will keep you entertained for days. Love it. Um, and I couldn't 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 agree more. To be fair, it will literally keep you entertained for days. And the days. sign of the sign of modern times, right? The governing body of a sport, because it's obviously you know modern day are like forced into advertising like electric you know like um virtual stuff like that and internet based stuff imagine all the uh, imagine all the the old boys um god rest their souls that are turning in their grave thinking god the tennis and rackets association are <laughs> advertising two gimps <laughs> i mean and the thing is if it if it was if it was if it was literally just two lads from like hatfield and <laughs> bristol just doing a podcast like it would sort of it would lack credibility but i think we have a bit of credibility in the game <laughs> lack credibility. it would though wouldn't well, it yeah. it would anyway, literally just be a chat isn't it big news today because today or, or around this time as we keep we keep mentioning it but we haven't actually formulated a proper date yet it's it's basically our birthday isn't it uh, it is our birthday, yeah. This is the birthday podcast. One year. Genuinely, it is one year since our first ever podcast. Um, well, well done, well done, you. Well, not well, not me. You were there as well. Well, I know, but as in, you know, well done you for sticking at it because I, I, you know, after about five or six, I knew you were ready to throw the towel in. So I wasn't ready to throw the towel in. I mean, it's just, just it's just thanks for keeping me, um, keeping me motivated. <laughs> so you posted, you posted our first episode on the twenty third of January, and today is the twenty first. Well, there you go. So what is it? What day is it today? Thursday. Yeah, so it's Saturday. Perfect. I'll crack open a bottle of poll. Any excuse, eh? Um, Paul Roger. Wonderful champagne, so I'm just unplugging. <laughs> Trying to get free bottles. We'll advertise your champagne if you give us free bottles. I actually put, um, so on my Instagram story a couple of days ago, maybe even yesterday, um, 
dog had been out into the back garden to the loo. So I was going out, out, out picking up crap. And we've got like some big bifold doors that just lead from the kitchen straight outside. Yeah. And I turned around and my dog was like, literally just sat there like looking out the window. It's wet. I think it's raining. And I'm out there picking up shit. And um, so I posted that as like my story. And somebody replied and was just like, is in the background. We've got like a sidewalk with loads of like, it's like our bar basically. Yeah. And uh, somebody replied and was like, that's a fantastic uh, collection of pole you've got going on in the background. <laughs> I was like, thanks very much for noticing that. Um, that is quite <laughs> brilliant. It's amazing what people look at, isn't it, when they've got time. Honestly, mate, everyone, anyway. at least people do look at it. Right, well. Let's um, we crack on? let's crack on, yeah. Um, as much as I do, I could just have that chat for forty minutes, but <laughs> no one would listen. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, uh, can you imagine when we do the the, uh, the beers episode, how long that episode will be? Because we'll just shoot the breeze for about forty minutes and then go. All right, we better start talking about something. <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> I can't wait for that episode. When lockdown ends, I think we're doing it. I've had enough. I've just had enough. Mate, we'll, we'll see if we can hire some like proper, some like proper sound kit. We'll just go and sit in spoons. I thought we might say some proper sound bloke to be on the podcast with us. Just invite <laughs> some bloke from Spoons. <laughs> we'll get some proper, like, soundproof headphones so that, like, they, the microphone can only pick up us and not the background noise and we'll just sit in Spoons and just get beers delivered on the app. Yeah, exactly. That would be quite funny. <laughs> only 50 minutes then. Uh, right, well, yeah. let's kick this off. We're talking about volume today, aren't we? We are, because... Um, We've done every single other shot in the, in the last year. <laughs> because because we've done a lot. And also, um, I think just things like, you know, when we were when we were chatting to Jonas um, a few weeks ago, which, by the way, has been the, the biggest podcast by a long way. Yeah, so, miles, hasn't you know, it? Yeah, up until then, the, 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 the guests, when we had Claire Fay on, that was mega. And the Jonas one's absolutely blown out of the water. So it obviously does some good advertisement over in Australia. I mean, in terms of views, so I've got a mate from uni who does, like, fashion blogging, and she's got, like, a YouTube channel. We get similar sort of views to her, so I think we're, we're a serious, like, outfit in terms of YouTube. Outfit. Yeah, we are. Um, but I was thinking about, you know, the, the Jonas episode, and we were basically talking about, like, the difference between tennis now and then and, and things like that. And um, he obviously mentioned, uh, like, Graham Highland volleying the serve when everyone was like, you know, what, what's this all about? And it just got me thinking... Um, that there's so many different direction, directions you can go with um, like with that topic because if you speak to I could go and speak to a number of like old boys in my club and say you know let's talk about like volleying and they would they would say like oh you should never volley like if you can leave it to the back wall you should always leave it to the back wall which is <laughs> that's the, how I used to play yeah exactly which is the old school classic style you know you should only volley if it's going in the dead on yeah and then there's like the counter argument which is like well if you're good at volleying why would you not choose to do it and so i was kind of thinking um you know at club level and then when you get to like a more serious standard um you know you've got that kind of that ball which comes at you and you're like oh should i volley it or should i leave it and i think it's quite an interesting it sounds like a really boring topic on the face of it but I think um, there's quite a lot to, to delve into about it. So, what do you think? Um, I think, yeah. Great, great discussion, Benno. You've summed it up well. <laughs> I think, yeah. I think, yeah. Um, I, I know for a fact I used to leave a lot to the back wall because that's how I was taught. Same. Um, and, like, it takes you so far because, like, against, like, goons who are just not putting anything on it, it's easy. But then you play against people who, who are sort of, a bit better and you need to take time away from them because if you just leave everything to the back wall a stuff beats you and also um you'll find that they've just got so much more time so they're just onto you the entire time yeah so so what how i would like phrase that to you if i was teaching you oh, yeah. and you're like oh should i volley this or should i leave it i would say like right you know exactly where you want to put the ball right the board's coming over you're like right i can do something with it I want to put the ball here, right? X marks the spot. I would say, do you, but as at like member level, do you fancy your chances of hitting that target by volleying it or leaving it to the back wall? Yeah. Because at like at club level, it doesn't matter if you're giving your opponent more time. If you can guarantee that you hit the spot, 
Mm. That's the option you should take. That is a good point, actually. Yeah, so certain times you will leave it to the back wall because it's like, yeah, I'm going to ping the grill from here. Or well, certainly yeah, that's also, the option. I mean, let's say, for example, like, let's take the, let's say the backhand side mm. because the forehand side you're going to be more aggressive with. Yeah. If, you, if you've got that ball that's kind of looping up on your back, well, not looping, but, you know, you've got that ball that's coming towards you on the backhand and I'm teaching, you know, my Mr. Average 45 handicap or Mrs. Average 45 handicap <laughs> I would say, right, your target is over towards the timber, and we put a marker on the floor and discuss where that exact spot is. I would just, you know, and then they go, well, should I volley it or leave it to the back wall? And I'm like, right, that's the target. What yeah. do you, what, like, what do you, don't, I'm not trying to tell you what the textbook says. What do you, Mr. or Mrs. X, what do you fancy your chances of hitting that target with? Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you leave it to the back wall and give your opponent more time, because at that handicap level, if you hit that spot, it's a good shot. Doesn't matter if they're stood in the middle, you know, and they've got time to move across or not. Hitting that spot is the most like important thing. Would you agree? Yeah, hundred percent. It's the end result, isn't it? If you're ending a point, like who cares how it gets there? Off the frame, off like some Durac lob, doesn't matter. Um, and then when you progress to another level, like your level, now it becomes like a bit, more, a bit, a bit more different. Or a bit different because yeah, you, you've you've got that time aspect in there. So you, know, you notice at my pla- you notice at my level, like the players who can volley, the players who can take it early and aren't afraid of really giving it a go, they, they do get results. It's noticeable when you play against them. It's like, oh no, like they're taking time out of the game. Back so up. if I said to you, you've got um, two options. You either leave this ball to the back wall. Let's assume you're going to hit your target regardless, okay? It's a lot and of, we're yeah. going to assume the target is not a grill. It's a ball, you know, it's a ball towards It's a winning the gallery. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if I said to you, you can either leave it to the back wall, guaranteeing hitting your target, yeah. but by leaving it to the back wall, you know that I'm now back to the middle, I'm set and I'm ready to try and go after it. Or do you want to intercept it on the volley with the obvious perk being that you're catching me a bit off guard and you're taking time away from me. However, you're not going to hit your target. You're going to spray maybe a meter or two meters in a random direction from that target. I mean, you've basically. You know what I mean, as in, would you sacrifice accuracy for time? Um, it depends. That's, and that's where that's where I think it's really a massive decision for people based on their yeah. A, their natural ability, but also their natural thought process. For me, a lot of the time, I don't even care about the target. I'm just like, let's get it over the net quickly. Right, let's do it. Like, <laughs> well, sort of... I mean, may, may, maybe this podcast is a bit too in depth for you, then. <laughs> well, not even. Well, I don't know. You can simplify it though, can't you? So, let's like, say, at certain levels, if you're confident of getting both over, um, and let's say you, you've got the opportunity of playing an attacking shot off the back wall, you probably can. But like, for me, I know if I miss that, I'm probably in a worse position than if I hit some volley. If I miss. Say that again. So if you miss the ball off the back wall, you're probably in a worse position than if you miss the volley. No, no, than if I hit like some volley that's just over. Yeah, okay. Um, but it depends what how you, in what mood you're in, right? If you're in like a ruthless mood, you might you might go target. I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, a couple of things that like spring to mind, um, like blast from the past. I remember talking to Rob, year, like, years ago um, and we were just like talking about movement and you know let's say like a good length ball let's say you've got a ball which is like it's going to get to the back wall but it's going to end up being like better than two and you're you're the one trying to retrieve it right yeah he said like as that ball gets fed in you're going to have an immediate like reaction which is not a forced reaction it's just going to be like an unconscious decision where your brain either says go and cut it off or leave it yeah and that's based on how you've been taught or what your previous racket sport experience etc etc so he said like at this this time years ago he's like for example you have been taught very classically so your default situation is to probably like move back towards the corner and try and like get this thing off the back wall or something like that he said for me because i've i was always brought up playing tennis my instinct is like see ball hit ball so my instinct is always go and try and cut that off he's like i'm not saying one of us is right and one of us is wrong but 
can you see what I'm getting at there? Like, yeah, 100%. It's just a natural, there is just a natural switch that tells you to do one or the other based on um, how you've always played or how you've been taught or what your experience is or, um, or, or whatever it is. So that will play a big, a big part in it. Um, and then the next thing was like, I remember when I moved up to Hampton Court and I got my handicap down in the first six months, like very quickly. And then over the next six months, I kind of got it down a bit more. And then I kind of stagnated for a few months, Ooh. which sounds like a bit greedy, but I, you know, I've made some like pretty quick progress by moving up to London. And I remember basically what got me from a minus handicap to a plus handicap was just deciding to intercept things more often, which was not natural for me. It was not what I, not necessarily not what I'd been taught, but like, you know, my instincts was always to leave it and hit a tighter shot. Yeah, you do always um, say this. You do always, you just say it a lot. I always think it like, sometimes I will accidentally leave one and it's now an accident, which is good because I always used to try and leave it. Um, and I'm like, I come mean, on, just take really it. it's not really an accident, is it? Because if, like, if you hit a tight shot as a result, there's nothing wrong with that at all. You just kind of think, no, we're talking. Have the opportunity to like slap my authority on the rally a bit more. We're talking. We're talking like in the back end corner, maybe where a ball's hitting the back wall straight. I think if a ball's hitting the back wall straight, you shouldn't be leaving to the back wall because you should be able to cut that off. Well, it depends on the ball, but of course but it yeah, does. Of I, course I, it does. I, I, but I, the prim principle. If, if, if you've got the option to volley it and the ball's going to hit the back wall and bounce away from you, it's pretty tough to hit a good shot from there. Yeah. But I, you know, I, I remember like just having just forcing myself when that ball was kind of like, shall I or shan't I? I was like, right, volley it. And I remember hitting really messy stuff compared to what I was used to doing. I was always like very tidy and I hit some really messy stuff, but I dropped like, I took like four or five points on my handicap. Oh, wow. Just because, just because of the time factor. You know, I said, you, you, if you leave everything to the back wall, Let's say, like, let's say, like your level, very low single figures. You leave everything to the back wall. Your opponent should be quick enough. I've got a few in mind that wouldn't be, but your opponent <laughs> should be quick enough that they can get to the middle and set themselves and be ready to move in any, any direction that you're about to move them in. Right? Yeah. If you cut everything off, the chances of them getting back to the middle and being able to set themselves and be ready are significantly reduced because they've lost probably a second and a half, two seconds. So what I find in real tennis, yeah, to link to this is, you know, let's say certain balls come over and you know exactly what you want to do. You're like, yeah, I've had this ball before, but once it's like the seventh shot in a rally, you are more tired. You will not move in the same way. And it is like draining to get yourself in the right position every single time. And if you've had like a, a, a physically intense rally, so let's say, the ball's just been pinging back on your side relentlessly. The chance of you like executing the right shot to the level you want to are unlikely. Like as much as your brain tells you, I know what to do here. I've done it before. Because you're like tired, you you might not do it well. Um, well yeah, you're absolutely right. And then and I find that happens to me a lot. And there's also situations where you know, if you want to be like really narrow-minded about it, you can't just talk about a one-off situation where you decided to volley it and your opponent still win it back when they'll be all, you know, they're talking trash. Yeah. Over let's say let's say let's say you have one ball a rally where you can volley it instead of leaving it to the back of the wall. And let's say, just for argument's sake, it takes one second of time away from your opponent. Yeah. Yeah. How many rallies are there in a match? Mate, so many. I don't know, look two hundred? Yeah, probably two hundred, yeah. 200 rallies in a match, 200 seconds, you've just taken three and a half minutes of effective rest from your opponent. I know it doesn't sound like much, but if you're, if, you know, the, if you're intersecting stuff early and you're making them move around a bit, it's like a boxing match, isn't it? It may, it may not, you may not get any immediate fruit for it, but in the later rounds, like in that third set, They've covered a lot more ground quicker yeah, trust, than they had to if you left it all to the back wall. It might be like, I'm actually, a bit, I'm actually a bit worn out from this. You've got to think that way as well, because if you do get into the third, you if you're in the first set or the second set, you won't necessarily think, oh, well, what's the point of making your opponent tired? But you will really see it in the third. Like, it might be like a drop of the shoulder, them dropping their shoulders, like 
a bit tired. You can tell like they're not as sharp at attacking as they were. And I think it does make a difference if you're willing to actually play the game and think, yeah, I will, I'm in this for the long term. I'm going to try and take, take time away from them. Well, I think if you look at like improvement ceilings, I call them, like, you know, what your, your potential level is, if you choose to leave everything to the back wall, your ceiling is so high. If you have the idea, at least, of chucking some volleys in there, I believe yeah. that your ceiling becomes higher. Yeah, I agree. You may never access and tap into that um, that potential, but you know you'd, you'd have like more strings to your bow. You've got different options. You can choose to like mix up your strategies a bit on that basis, and and ultimately, if you look at anybody in any sport now, it's very rare that you get specialists mm. like who are just really good at one one thing. And what Tim Hammond? Kind of, Tim Hammond at volleying. Exactly, that doesn't happen anymore. Like they can do it all. All the Lawless guys, they're all they're all um, fit. They've all got good forehands and backhands. They all can hit bombs from the baseline, they can all like play serve and volley. Um, they may not be as good at it, but they can all do it. Like they can all volley. You don't have those specialist guys. And I yeah. think it's the same, you know, you want to consider that in, in realers as well. If you are a specialist non volleyer and you come up against somebody who is who has a more rounded game, may not be able to do some things as well as you, but has that extra has that extra shot, you're probably going to struggle against them. Because they yeah. can do everything. I think as well, if you had one thing, you want to have a volley. I play well, yeah, all these... Like, all these... You know, the, amount of, the amount of um, kind of like changing it slightly, like the amount of times I've had members come up to me in a lesson and be like, I want to learn how to volley return. And I'm like, no, you don't. You just don't, you just don't need to. Like, yeah. you know, and, or I'm like, why? And their reasoning is because their opponent keeps hitting the nick. I'm like, they can't no. keep hitting the nick. Like, this is one of your... Stop saying this on the podcast, Ben. This is the 19th time you've said it. What? About hitting the nick on the set. <laughs> what? Well, like the the volley is like two, two different sides of it, really, isn't it? You yeah. either volley something because you, you're scared of the nick or the dead on, in which case it's a defensive shot that you don't want to do, which you're more likely to mess up. Yeah. Or it's an option. It, or it, it's an option. And you're like, right, I want to volley. I want to take things on and um, and try and do that. But well, I mean you, I mean I did all that years ago. You you tell me what well, you know you you've you're newer to it than me. I don't think twice about it now, but yeah. when you first turned up at Leamington you were you would leave a lot to the back wall that I Yeah. I thought you could potentially volley. It wasn't the right, the wrong choice, but I was like, oh you know you could volley that. Yeah I remember Drew saying when I was at Queens he was like you play like Junior Snow, just leave everything, just stop doing it, just just take a bit more early and I was like, yeah well maybe I will. Um, uh, I don't know. I think it's like I think it's just confidence in knowing that if it is a volley, you can get it over rather than hitting the wood. And I think a lot of people have put off volleying because they they maybe hit one and they hit the wood, and it's like, oh god, how have I done that? And like, I was even scared when people hit the dead on because it was like, oh, I don't back myself to defend it. And when you're in that mentality, you literally won't get one over. So I think it was just mentality, really, thinking, yeah, I well, can. That's what volley. I mean. I think if I think if you, if you look at the volley as like a defensive option. And you're like, oh god, I only need to do it when the ball's going in the dead on. Like you say, you kind of, you almost live in fear of it slightly. Yeah. So when you get it, and then you fluff it, you justify it and go, see, that's why I don't do it. Yeah. Like, well, you're fluffing it because you're so like, you think you're so scared of it. You just, I remember telling myself like, come on, don't be scared. Like, keep your feet on the ground and you'll volley fine. It's good. Yeah, and you know, from a tactical perspective, if you choose to volley something and you're hitting slightly looser shots but you're putting your opponent under a lot more time pressure I think like at your level I think that's a really positive thing to do because if you're if you're doing something like that it's not like your volleys are going to be loose forever right yeah, if, you, of if, course you start, if you start to get in tune with doing that as an option it will get better yeah I can't wait to actually get on court and hit a few volleys to be fair well look at someone like um, okay so think, think of think of somebody in the top 10 or top 20 that cuts things off a lot um oh my god Vergona. 
Yeah, I'm thinking of someone like Steve, right? Yeah. I don't know the why ball. it took me so long to think of Steve there. <laughs> the, the ball is always on your side of the net. It's a great example. I think, yeah, he, he generally just gets over really quick, always. Like, always, it's just like a, a boast or a volley or, like, if it's off the back wall, if it's over really it quick. cut it off, he'll cut it off. There's yeah, obviously yeah. A, there's a very... There's a very yeah, there's a, there's a very big lawn tennis background there, obviously. But yeah. if you imagine for every rally, the ball is in your half of the court for 60% of the time and only 40% in his half of the court, surely, statistically, he's more likely to win the point than you. Yeah. I, and, I, it's true, yeah. You know, it's, it's quite a... He's quite talented as well. I think he does well. It's quite, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just like saying, you know, Steve likes to intercept and... If the ball's not in your half of the court, you can't lose the point, right? Yeah, you can't. You can't. You can it's like it's like having a it's like a half. it's like having a corner in your opposite. It, uh, it's like having an attacking corner. It's like great, we can't concede yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I think. Like whenever I watch football, I see a corner. I'm like, that's just like hitting some like volley. Like because, oh thank God, it's on their side of the net. I can't lose. They well, this is one of those things where, like, your team's 1-0 up, which doesn't happen very often with you at the moment. Chelsea Mate, fan, don't but... even. I'm so upset. <laughs> um, uh, and it's, like, the 88th minute or something, or the 90th minute, and you're thinking, I've oh, got three minutes at a time left. And you get and an attacking team, corner. Your team get, like, a corner or a throw-in, like, down in the corner. You just think, the, the first thing you think is, that's a minute gone. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. It, it will take them a minute to get the ball from from us and in, not into our goal. Yeah. So you're like, that's a minute gone. Um, and that's you know that's kind of what it's like, isn't it? You've really got to worry about the ball. You know, in order in terms of like winning or losing a point, you can only lose when it's on your side of the net. So that's a good thing, guys. I think anyone who's listening, one interesting thing to think like if if you're interested in winning points, just don't don't have the ball on your side. Let them let them do it. Let, let them play one more shot, um, and yeah, control what you can control. I guess. Yeah, I mean, if you look at um, if you if someone you know we've had this conversation before, and we were like, oh, if you were taking somebody from scratch, what would their background be? And I always say lawn tennis over squash massively. Um, lawn tennis players don't miss volleys, right? No, they don't. So automatically, when the time is right to kind of say right maybe try and intercept a few and, and stuff as they get better. That's a natural thing for them. It's not something they have to learn. And also, you completely, you know, teaching teaching them how to, like, volley return when they get to a certain level, it's going to be far easier than teaching a squash player or something like that. Yeah. Because it's a natural, it's a natural shot that they use all the time. So, um, you know, there's no... I, I don't think there's any... Um, uh, you know, it, it's no secret, like, why, you know, the current world champion is traditionally a lawn tennis player. Yeah, he was quite good at lawn tennis. Is, my old, my housemate actually was saying this. So, see, again, he's, he, he knows about real tennis because I've talked about it and stuff. And he was saying, like, obviously it's a small game, but you think, like, the, the guys who are at the top of real tennis, they're getting to play a sport they enjoy whereas they wouldn't have made it in, like, normal tennis or squash or whatever. And I was like, yeah, that's a good point, to be fair, because, like, there are so many like mega talented lawn tennis players, mega talented squash players who will never make it, but they're sick. And it's like, well, yeah, they're ob- they should come to real tennis and actually pl- be a professional sportsman. Do you know what I mean? So, well, so here's, here's the crack, right? The crack. If you're 17 or 18 and somebody like me marches into like county lawners, right, and basically speaks to the coaches and just goes, right, which one of these like who's going to make it who's not and if they're just like oh these five here they're not going to make it they're going to play like good county yeah. tennis and they're going to be like seriously good but in terms of making it to the top never going to happen they're going to lose money and they're going to end up doing a different job or career at some point right yeah. if I walked up to them and said guys I've got some bad news for you you're not going to make it <laughs> but you can seriously make it in the world of real tennis oh easy easily make it in the world of real tennis they're not going to take that are they because they're going to be 17 18 and they're going to be like oh, what's he talking about i'm definitely going to make it do you know what i mean and i'm yeah, not saying yeah. like the it, the coaches are pulling the wool over their eyes or anything like that but like if if they're not going to make it 
then we need to find a way to get them to us because they will make it yeah. at real tennis. Because they can volley, because they can take, they can just get the ball over there quickly. Mate, I got I got into the county squad at football a couple of times for Dorset. Yeah, but yeah, no. But there's only there's got, only seventeen players. You got to remember, guys. You got to remember, guys, that the biggest team in Dorset's Bournemouth. Premier League was was Premier League. Yeah. Um, I'm joking. Yeah, I mean, Yeovil Town isn't even in Dorset. Yeah, it's in um, is, is it in Devon? Somerset. Somerset. Okay. Um, but I'd never played like messed around playing lawners and I was always like a if someone if you showed me like a brand new sport I'd be decent at it I'd pick it up quickly and I'd be decent immediately I was like a jack of all trades master of none and yet I've managed to make world number four of real tennis just through like hard work do you think you'll be remembered Ben at real tennis well not at the moment because the, the honours list is a bit empty for now yeah um no if my, if, my, if my career, if I carried on doing, if my career ended today or I carried on doing this for another 10 years and making semis in the old final, then no, why would I be remembered? I don't remembered know. for what? Was a good lad? <laughs> we have, in 50 years, no one's going to like know who I was. Like, there any, you've got to think, when the, when the next, when in two generations' time, the only thing that people see is names on a board. The, that's the only reason why people are really remembered and famous. True, true. Brutal. So, like, Rob Fay's obviously always going to be remembered for de- decades and generations to come because his name's everywhere. Yeah, it is. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to, like, and it's a good try to think of somebody, like, well, I don't know. I'm not going to pick names out of that. Anyway. anyway. There's, an endless list of, there's an endless list of people who have not won major tournaments who have been seriously good at real tennis who unfortunately in 100 years no one will know who they were because their names aren't anywhere mate I'll remember so Nick Woods the same as me at the moment um, <laughs> one of them anyway are you going to be remembered that's my goal so it's an external goal your goal is driven by what other people think yeah mate you know me Instagram generation <laughs> Instagram Instagram generation um, but yeah back to volleying before we wrap this up and talk about yes okay. um I think, for obviously the average club player, when we do get back out there, um, because you can't practice right now, um, I think if you can just take a few lessons on volleying, so I think start with the defensive stuff and then you've got to be thinking like, well, can I volley this? Can I do it? Maybe I can. Maybe I'll have to take a few losses. Maybe I'll have to miss a few balls. But I think if you get into the habit of looking for that volley, um, good things happen. Yeah, it's... It's one it's, exactly. It's one of those two. It's, it's two things. You either naturally, you're either naturally good at or good at it, or you're. Or it's not a natural kind of shot for you. But you know, let's just get rid of this stigma of like how real tennis should be played from the textbook from 1960. Like volleys exist, they happen, and people are good at them. And if you are good. at doing it, you will be a better player for it. It's so funny as well. Volleys exist, they happen okay. I'm not denying the existence of a volley. Well, so, so if you t- if you talk to anybody in the older generation who, you know, who's been in the same, like, lifetime as us, we're privileged enough to watch, like, um, the greatest of all time play, they would always turn around and be like, you know, oh, God, Rob's so amazing, and blah, 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 like, play such a good game of tennis, stuff like that. Rob volleys all the time. But like, is what's like two of his biggest weapons are like forehand volley winner and volley return assert. Yeah. So you know people are fickle. It doesn't matter. Like they can't say, oh, you should only volley. You know, I've got like Norman Hyde would say to me, oh, you should, you should only volley if the ball's going in the dead up. I'm like, all right, you tell that to Rob Fay. But well, you know, well, Rob's different. All right, okay, so Rob's different. I guess he is. You know, but you know, it's. it's People will only think what, you know, see what they want to see, won't they? The fact is, volleys are there and they are weapons. If it's not a natural shot for you, it's an, it's a, it's an, easy, it's an easy shot to, um, to figure out. Think about it, you're plucking the ball out of the air rather than letting it bounce off surfaces and trying to read angles. Yeah. What's the point? Yeah, have a lesson. Negate it, Seriously, negate have it. A lesson. Yeah. You might, if you volley, you don't have to worry about it. Also, very quickly, did you see the Instagram post from Middlesex 
students the other day. Oh, like, I did, yeah. Which, if which you, pill? If you could take a pill, what would you take? I, I can't. And they were like, oh, um, 100% of the people said they'd have unlimited fitness and speed. And they were like, I was like, no, that's wrong. I would not have taken that pill. You don't need it. Rob doesn't have that. <laughs> well, I would have just taken hit the nick every time. Yeah, because then you win. Well, how can you be beaten if you hit the nick every single time? Nick would have that pill. But if, if, if I hit the nick against you, but you've got the unlimited fitness pill, that means you can run around all day. It doesn't mean you can get everything back. It means I can just pick it up off the floor quicker. Yeah, I'll just draw, I'll just hit the nick. And whatever ball you get over, I'm going to hit the nick with. Yes, thanks. I'll take that pill. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, good. And <laughs> what do you think about the volley? Oi, Benno, by the way, um, you did a post on Facebook ages ago being like, best retriever of all time, hashtag view from the hands. I think we should do more stuff like that. Just like poll, random polls on Insta. All right, let's stick, let's, we'll stick one out there later on. Just put like, episode. best volley of all time. Anyway, right, okay, so we're talking well, about... That's probably a good one based on the fact that we're talking about volleys. Yeah, topical, eh? Um, so, obviously, last week we neglected to talk about an American court, but this week we are not going to neglect that. We're talking about Philly today, are we? RCOP. Recop. Recop? Um, yeah, yeah, Recop. Um, Philadelphia, I've never been there, no. Have you not? No. <laughs> Mate, what? How many times have you done, like, these, have you been to America and done the little tours and stuff? Well, I've, I was in America for three months and I've been another time other than that. So you did Chicago for three months and that was just literally Chicago, was it? No, nah, no, nah, because I did Tuxedo, New York and Aiken. You didn't go to Philly? I didn't go to Philly. Mate, it's two hours. It's a $15 two-hour bus from New York City. Okay, thanks for that. Michael Palin. Um, but yeah, I've not been. I want to go. Mate, you should, because... I know, me, I want to go. For me, as you walk into the front doors, Philly is the grandest entrance hall of any Royal Tennis Club ever. Wow. It is insanely picturesque the moment you walk through that front door. You've got this massive, big like hallway and then you've got these like big stairs that kind of they're not like dead straight does that make sense they're like wide at the, at the bottom and then they kind of get a bit narrower yeah and then like you can peel off and go left or right like it's absolutely bonkers that club i love it it's the first american club i ever went to really yeah the first was that where you played mark divine played played us open Golden, was... yeah the old mark divine story the great story can you read no don't retell really it kind of <laughs> it's a great story um well, I'm sure I'm sure it's been mentioned. Yeah, as yeah, I know. Um, um, Philly. I can't, do you know what's really annoying is I can picture the badge, but I can't picture the year. It might be 1886. It might be the same as Queens. 1886 is what I'm going for. Yeah, uh, I've got a shirt, a Philly shirt, which Asher gave me. So I think it's 1886 or 1888. I don't know. I, I think I'll, it's. Um, I'll find out for you. I think it's 1886, but um, I mean one of those. It's just one of you know we'll get bored of talking about it, but these typical American clubs which have just got absolutely everything. Yeah. Amazing changing rooms. Mate, eighteen eighty nine. Oh, there you go. So we were three years out. Apparently, um, apparently the shower. Apparently the showers rooms. are good, right? So the changing rooms are like similar style to New York, but the, the changing room itself is nowhere near as big. But there's all there's a little kind of a bit around the corner where there's couches and a TV and stuff. So it's it's much more relaxed than New York. People are like sitting there watching like sport and stuff. So watching the, the showers, soccer. mate, are absolutely insane. Why? Um, so the, the, the shower heads are huge right. and the power, like the, the, amount, power? Just, the amount of water that comes out of them, it's like the amount of gallons per second is like something ridiculous. Um, like they used to have they used to have like a little um, lip at the front of the shower, which is maybe, I don't know, six, eight inches tall or something. And you see if they just kind of like kind of step over it to get into the shower. And you could have the shower on and within like 30 seconds, you would be stood, your feet would be underwater because it couldn't drain out quick enough. That's how like, that's how aggressive the like water is there. So where did the water go after it like drowned well, your feet? It would, it would drain, but it was just, it, it was coming out of the shower head quicker than it could drain. So, so therefore you obviously get like a build up of water. That's unreal. Good water consumption. Um, Good for the environment. Exactly. No. Um, you've got a pool there, gym, loads of squash courts. They've had quite a lot of work done over the last few years, actually. Like, Didn't they build another squash court? Yeah, that, that floor that they've got is like really, really plush. Um, 
it's just a great, it's just a great club. It's a good so story. Like, it's, it's a good story about the new squash court. Didn't a member say like, "Can we get a new squash court?" And they were like, "No." And then he was like, "Why was if I pay for it?" And they were like, "Yes," or something like that. <laughs> I think that's the story. Money talks. Yeah, I think that, uh, I that, think I think it was something similar to that. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. Maybe not quite as cutthroat, but. Um, they've got like, you know the basement bar um, with like a pool table and a dartboard down there and stuff. So you can. It's one of those places again where you could just turn up in the morning and you could just be there all day and get so much stuff done, but not feel like you're doing the same. You know, imagine going and sitting at Hardwick House for the day. Hardwick House. <laughs> you know, I can't imagine. Like Twenty it. minutes. After 20 minutes, you'll be like, what do I do? Yeah, I can't imagine it. Whereas Philly, like all these American clubs, you can literally just pitch a tent and stay there all day. Yeah, no, it's, um, a, it's absolutely, a good one. Absolutely brilliant. Um, anyway, so the core. Uh, it's like dead rough, isn't it, the floor? Yeah, so you can, yeah, you can rip through a pair of shoes and like, you can shave your rackets down on yeah. the floor there. Yeah, and apparently moving's really good because you're really grippy. Yeah, it's properly, it's the floor is very, very rough. Um, I mean, I feel sorry for the guys over there, like making the balls, because they just get chewed up. Yeah. The floor is like so sandy, it's so rough. Every time the ball hits it, it just like checks. And um, seriously, yeah, they, they just you well, just the, the covers just get absolutely. They could put a brand new set of balls on the covers and like rinsed in like a week, really? like five days. Yeah. And when I say rinse, I mean you've gone through the cover and you've just got the exposed ball underneath it. Like, it's just savage. Does Lummers and Ike and Robbie, do they make the balls? Yeah, and Asher, I would imagine. Yeah, no, wow, wow. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's a black, like, black walls and stuff. I think the floor is kind of like, it's a really, really faded, like, reddy pink. Yeah. Like, but really faded. The numbers, I always, when I first got there, I thought it was like the Transformers. Have you seen the numbers? The Transformers? No, I, I, Mate, I can't remember what it's like. Mate, Google it now, like oh. while I'm on the phone. Racket Club of Philadelphia, court tennis. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the numbers are like really, really square and robotic. The Transformers. That's, <laughs> That's like what it. I used to think of. No. Um, yeah, yeah, it is, it is quite square. I can't actually see the numbers though, which is annoying. Because when you've just got the FG and stuff like that, you can't really see it. But um, anyway, um, yeah, I was right. It's kind of a faded pinky red floor, black walls. Very, very bouncy. The floor, obviously, because it's so grippy, kind of slows the ball down. Bounces around the corner, like really big angles. Um, you know, if someone hits like a cut volley at you and it comes around the corner, you have to like back away and yeah. take it like in the backhand side. Wow. Like it's, it's, it's very extreme. Yeah. Um, but, you know, endless rallies. You've got to be able to hit targets there. I mean, uh, Barney Tanfield snuck past him in five I think the last time the US Open was there mm. um, because it doesn't really take a railroad and he was just hitting he, I couldn't serve anything that wouldn't just sit waist high off the back wall um, and he was just lumping dead ons past me for like five sets I was, and I remember actually thinking like, oh, I'm actually going to lose <laughs> I, I, I literally cannot I can't do anything to stop him hitting a target I think you had match points in the third in that one did I? yeah didn't feel like it. I mean, that would have been that would have been the most unfair straight sets win ever. Do you have to um, like if you're if you're like rallying like I assume it's just you just can't win. One of those I mean, courts. It's one of those courts where you like if you just kind of just hit balls into areas, it's not going to get you anywhere. Yeah, got like, you. You have your length has to be so specific to win on the floor. Um, otherwise, you're just going to just absolutely tough it out. I mean, when I played Barney that time, I felt I felt how Cam must have felt in the 2018 World Championship. Interesting. Just watching ball after ball just go past you, yeah, target, just thinking like I literally don't know how to stop it. Like, I don't know how to stop it. I can't even stop it. Yeah. Um, the uh, timbre's a bit yeah, weird, isn't it? Bouncy. Like when it's main wall timbre, it hits the back wall. It's like Oxford, right? It hits the back wall quite uh, early. Like main wall timbre, and then it goes. Do you know what? If you if you hit a straight timber from the forehand corner, it will go across and hit the side wall really deep and go flush with the back wall. That happens quite a lot. Oh God. Um, yeah, that does happen a lot. I'll tell you what is good fun at Philly doubles. Why is that? Just because it's so bouncy and lively. It's absolutely, but it's like playing doubles at like Paris and stuff. 
when it's so bouncy and lively like that, it's just so much fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just just so much fun. Mate, I, I can't believe you've not been there. Of all the clubs you've been to in the States, you've got to go. Just haven't fact, been, mate. I think, well, I think you should just make a purpose visit. Like, flights to Philly in the winter. Like, now, flights to Philly right now will be about 250 quid. I mean, yeah, I will. I will be going. I think my, my dad was saying we we're going to go in November or something to this tournament. I can't remember the Jimmy Dunn. I think. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, so I want to go. I want to do the US Open though. I think the next one is in Philly, isn't it? <laughs> all the best. All the best players have their first US Open in Philly. Yeah, hopefully I won't get someone hitting like bottom corner dead ons against me. At about five miles an hour, but thinking, oh, why can't I stop these? Yeah, they're too accurate. <laughs> why can't I stop these? They're just too um, good. So, oh God, well, you're going to have to do it, mate. You're going to have to do it. I will, don't worry. I'll get it done. I'll get it done. Um, right, okay. Good. Let's talk about the pros. Any good players who come from Philly? Do you know what? Philly is a hotbed for US pros. So, Chism, 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 Chism. is still there. John Cashman. Yeah. Um, Jimmy Burke. Yeah. All Philly-based. All from out in the hood, I think. Um, Ed They've found their way. Ed Knoll or something? Ed Knoll was, I think, so there's Ed and Mike Knoll. I think Mike's the son. I think Ed was like the president or the chairman of tennis or something. So oh, actually someone will correct me if I've got that wrong. Sorry, yeah, no, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Apologies. Mike, for you Mike, Knoll was a, Mike Knoll was a pro. Yeah, a pro briefly. Um, I think he started playing again a few years ago. Lummers was training with him. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, didn't he go up and play in the gold racket in Tuxedo? He did, yeah, the one I was at, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So I think that was when he was kind of, he was playing again. Um, Barney Tanfield. Oh, yeah, Gay Barney, King. yeah. Gay Gay Kinsler. Kinsler. Good night. Um, there must be one more we can think of. Well, there probably is. There's probably some absolute world beats. We'll probably find out. Nah, James Asher first played at Manchester, mate. We'll, we'll probably find out that, like, Gene Scott was born in Philly or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I don't know. What about all of the American like greats of the past, like the Goulds and stuff? Are they, I don't know where they were from. Jay Gould, he was from his own core. Well, yeah, okay. But, like, there, were, there were a few more. But anyway, I, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. But there's a pretty good... We've got a good track record with, um, with you know, turning players into pros. Yeah, that's true, actually. I wonder who will be the next one. Well, so at the moment, you've got... Well, when before Jimmy... Um, Burke left Boston and let's say it was a few let's say 10 years ago when Gabe was still a pro as well you'd have had Robbie Cashman Jimmy Gabe and Barney so you'd have had five pros in America that all came through Philly yeah so it's a big it's a big club big hitters massive yeah literally big hitters Um, right (laughs) what else um, anything about like the members, like the culture there, is it quite similar to all the other ones? Like, do people just go there and chill and like play like all the sports? It's so probably... I would say you've got like New York, which is the um, like let's say you've got New York, Chicago, and Philly. They've all got the same um, like setup. They've got the same facilities. New York is the most serious. Yeah. Chicago is serious. But more relaxed than New York, and then Philly's more relaxed than Chicago. Got you, got you. So Philly, everybody's there for the crack. Like everybody's in it for like a good time, good fun. No one does anything like too outrageous. Ri- yeah, no one does anything out- outrageous. But it's not like it's not um, it- it's not like super serious. And you know what? I think that's just like Philly as a city as well. Got you. It doesn't take itself like too seriously. It's like it's a great place. I love I love going to Philly. Mate, who knows? Um, we'll, we'll be there next. We'll be there next year, this year yeah, when you open it's up. It's just it's a very relaxed, fun place to be. Good. Um, you know, you want to turn up and look like relatively smart, but you're not going to get kicked out if you're not in a suit and, and stuff like that. So as long as, long as they're, they're very relaxed, as long as you don't try and go too far and like take the mick, um, basically anything goes. Indeed. Right, well, if you had to choose your favourite thing about Philly, your one thing, because I've never been there, so I can't really comment, but we did this for, like, Newport, didn't we? What's your favourite thing? Um, oh, there's two things. Ooh! Same both. Right. Same both. That's okay, mate. 
um, just the ent- just walking in the front door. Yeah, nice, nice. And literally walk in the front door, and you're just like, wow, this is incredible. Best best entrance hall in the world. Um, and the second thing would be the steam room is self operated. Really? Yeah. So it's not like you know you get like a little plume of steam and you have to sit there for 10 minutes while it kind of cools down again you're in full control of how much steam's in that room oh nice i like that um yeah the entrance the entrance hall just walk in and you just like immediately wowed you're like yeah this is this is nice but it's just like the relaxed feel that goes with it it's just it's perfect it's my favorite it's my favorite club in america rate that get it out on record um well I think we should hook a few in. I reckon with the Lummers one, a lot of people probably from Philly listen. So, and the USCTA will like it. We're, we're back on the US theme. So, we really are um, a multinational podcast um, in terms of <laughs> advertising the game. We try to be. Yeah. Well, you've, you've not been, but. Um, Thanks, mate. Yeah, next time you're there. <laughs> next time, I know. Mate, I can't. It just upsets me that we aren't allowed to actually go to tournaments stuff because. The amount of banter. Like it's so much fun. The banter we could have, like, on a you podcast, should, just getting some. Genuinely, something. genuinely, what you should do is fly on a Friday morning, like, get the get the early flight, fly there, get there, like, lunchtime, get to the club by, like, early to mid afternoon, go and have a shower, say hello to the guys, go and have, have, a a, have a hit, um, and then literally, like, go in on the Saturday, have another hit. Grab some lunch, have a steam, use the gym, go and explore the squash course and stuff. Go around, uh, you know, and then just like go out for beers on Saturday night, Sunday, walk around Philly because it's a very manageable size city. Walk around Philly, go and see loads of sites, fly back Sunday night. Honestly, be the best two days ever. I'll write that down. And it won't cost you that much to get there. No, I'm not it's worried insane. about money. In fact, mate, I might do it. Like, as soon as we're allowed to go, I might just go to Philly for a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, yeah, love it there. That's good. I'll, I'll write that down. That could actually happen. Honestly, like a little two, little two day. A two day. Oh, that would be an alpha two day. That one. Brilliant. You wouldn't need to worry about jet lag. Just um, get on with it. Anyway, your parcel's not arrived. What are you on for the rest of today? Yeah, I'm actually so I'm actually um, building building a gym in the garage. Oh, nice! Um, so phase one of the operation. So I was... I did a bit of a workout yesterday. I did the 64. It's called the 64 100 100. So 64 curls, 100 yeah. 100 press ups and 100 pull ups. Lovely. Um, and that 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 gets you feeling quite good. So. Mate, it would take me forever to do 100 pull ups. Seriously. I, yeah, well, I don't have the. I'm not really shaped for pull-ups, am I? Short and stocky, short levers. You want someone that's like you want someone with that just weighs nothing. I yeah. weigh too much. Exactly like lemmers, isn't it? It, it would honestly. It, I would have to if I had to do a hundred pull-ups. I would have to do twenty sets of five. <laughs> hundred sets of one. I would need like a minute. A minute. Like literally, like a minute at least between each set of five. Honestly, if you said do hundred pull ups, that'd take me half an hour. Interesting. Well, that's why you need my my sixty four one hundred one hundred workout. But there we go. Um, I mean, I demolish you at everything else in the gym, but I can't do pull ups. Yeah, including benching. Um, um, yeah, so um, gym floor being built yesterday, I had to do like the waterproof layering just because the garage is sat slightly below like the garden, like yeah, very yeah. slightly. So. Got like a big waterproof layer in there, loads of insulation, which is all down on the floor. Got the wood turning up today. Ben the builder. Um, and then I've got all the gym mats. Hey, mate, gym mats are so expensive. I spent 440 quid on gym mats. Jeez, that's just that's your income for the podcast, gone. Exactly, it's just literally gone. I need Paul Rogers to sponsor us. Um, yeah, so hopefully the wood will turn up at some point today. Lay that down, put the mats over the top, and hey presto, got all, got most of the gear in there already. So love it. There'll be there'll be a picture. I'll send you a picture. Oh good, put it on I'll your take, story. pictures of like each stage of the build. I like that. Um, well, nonetheless, that sounds like a good day. I'm off to work shortly. So different. Anything things. later? Going to do your sixty-four hundred hundred or whatever? Uh yeah, every day I reckon. Why not? consistency really not to nonetheless guys um until next time a year since the first podcast thank you for all of your support let's here's to another year 
or 10.